Jesus has come for all of humanity in order that he may make a worshiper out of you and out of me who are left to our own default. We are rebels and against God and he wants to do a transforming work in our hearts to restore us again to the place that we might be people who worship like we were first created. Just a couple things this morning before we have a chance to uh, think together about our prayer time and corporate prayer this morning. First is uh, what Kristen has already mentioned with regards to our time of framing out the calendar year as far as Lent is concerned. <clears throat> now, some of us come from a bit more liturgical backgrounds than others, and if you've been coming to Sharptown Church for a while, you know that we highlight this period of time on the church calendar, but uh, Lent for many of us is just another uh, way in which we designate uh, our calendar and recognize we kind of move closer to Easter and, and what Lent is about. I wanted to just uh, highlight for you that uh, Lent begins on the 22nd of February, 22nd of February, and we want to take time inside of the church calendar this year in the life of Sharptown Church to uh, not only observe these Sundays leading up to Easter, but also invite you to participate. Many of us, again, have come from backgrounds where the only thing we know about Lent is we had a relative who gave up eating something during Lent. Or we have a friend who added something to their schedule during Lent. And I want to invite you to consider the idea that Lent, the time of preparation and the time of consideration as we move closer to the historical event of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ and the bodily resurrection of Jesus uh, can in fact be a, a wonderful experience for all of us collectively as a church as we look in God's direction and invite Him to do something inside of our hearts. And so we're going to talk a little bit more about that next Sunday and the opportunities that are available. And I merely want to invite you that this year, this year may be different than any other year uh, in your Christian experience. But you're going to do something during Lent uh, this year that you've not done before. You're going to either add something to your calendar, you're going to take something away from your schedule, and I want to invite you to even think a little bit about that. Uh, that could have something to do with a, a prayer meeting, uh, could have something to do with a small group, could have something to do with coming to the events here at the church, could have something to do with not using your phone for a day. I mean, there are a variety of things we could do to focus our attention a bit more upon who God is inside of our life for Lent. So I uh, want to go ahead and highlight that. The second thing I just want to draw to your attention, and I was just completely remiss about doing in the first service, uh, but we thought about during Sunday school, was that uh, at Asbury College this week, uh, there is a spontaneous move of God's Holy Spirit which is happening. Uh, Asbury is uh, my, where I did my undergraduate work. Asbury, we actually had a family that was there. One of our students was there during scholarship weekend this past weekend. But chapel happened on Wednesday of this week, and chapel service is still going on it, around the clock. It, it hasn't stopped. And so uh, there is a part of Asbury College that's steeped in the revival movement of the holiness movement. And so uh, many are, are going ahead and, and hashtagging the Asbury Revival, and you can find it online that way. But uh, last night at 9 o'clock uh, in Hughes Auditorium, where all of the students gather for weekly chapel, at 9 o'clock last night, though, do we have that picture? Yeah, so this is the picture. Uh, it's, there's hundreds of people there. Again, this service didn't end on Wednesday when it was supposed to at 11 o'clock, and is still going on. It's still going on. And one of the things that's happening is kind of a spontaneous move of praise, of worship, of confession, of adoration. I have a variety of people, friends of mine who are faculty on, at Asbury University and at Asbury Seminary. Uh, they've ducked in and spent some time. Uh, there's a variety of places online that you can go and to read about this. But uh, what's fascinating is that this is not something that's contrived. It wasn't on the schedule. It wasn't this is what we do. This is something that God has 
done in the life of these students. And it's not even the faculty that are driving this. It's the students that are leading this. And with a sensitivity to God's Holy Spirit, with a time of confession, with a time of reflection and renewal, that God's Holy Spirit is, is moving inside of this place. Now, what might be interesting for you to know is that 53 years ago, in 1970, a similar happened, thing happened that lasted for six weeks. Six weeks. What transpired from that was the fact the gospel was taken around the world by people whose lives were impacted by a movement of the Holy Spirit. And so when students went to tell their story, God would remarkably show up in power and in glory. When people would go and testify inside of their home church, God would show up. I merely want to invite you this morning during our prayer time, and we have a, a very scripted time of prayer in just a few moments, but I just would like to invite you, will you offer words of encouragement, offer words of request back to God that God would continue to show up on not only Asbury's campus, but maybe even, maybe he would even continue to do a work inside of our lives in such a way that we would be open to the movement of His Holy Spirit inside of our lives. So with that in mind, I'd like to invite you to stand, please. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> when we share together corporate prayer on Sunday, uh, it is important that we have a chance to go ahead and pause kind of take a deep breath and set the things that are bidding for our attention aside if we could and, uh, and frame that time so we might ask God to talk to us and we might talk to God. Oftentimes, public prayer is crafted around a couple of key important things. From time to time, whether it's out loud like we're going to do today or whether it's just kind of in our own hearts and minds, people who lead in prayer use an, an outline in their head, an acronym from time to time that has four elements to it. It's really a good acronym for your own prayer time. A-C-T-S. That's helpful because it's one of the books of the Bible, right? So Acts. Adoration, Confession, Thanksgiving, and Supplication. Now, supplication is a, it's a Christian word, you know, that we use in the churchese word that we use, and uh, Christianese. It just means praying for other people, okay? Praying for other people. Adoration is reflecting and ascribing back to God the character, His nature, His glory, the things we read about in the Bible that talk to us about who God is. Adoration. Confession. I'm sorry. Forgive me. I made this. I sinned. Clean my heart. Cleanse me. Forgive me. Confession. Thanksgiving. Gratitude for what God has given to us. Gratitude for our family, our friends, what He's doing at Asbury College, that His Holy Spirit is so present supplication, praying for other people. Now, I, I want to invite you to do something that's going to make you crazy uncomfortable, okay? Because here in the Western world, you know, we don't all talk at one time because we like to be heard, right? So whenever we say something, we kind of defer. If somebody else is talking, we got in trouble for interrupting when we were younger, and so we don't interrupt. But when it comes time to the S part, I'm going to ask you out loud to name the name of people that you're carrying, that you're bearing with you today. People that are heavy upon your heart. People who have uh, sickness or need a touch or who have a fractured relationship. A-C-T-S. Now, the reason why we're standing then in the presence of God and really with a reminder that His Holy Spirit can have access to our hearts and lives is that as part of our worship this morning, 
we might wait before him. And I'm going to walk us through that. What's hard about this is there's really never enough time, right? We wish the A part would be longer or the wish the Thanksgiving part would be longer. But kind of stay with me, if you will. And then I want to invite you, speak the person's name who you're carrying inside of your heart this morning, the circumstance, and speak that right out loud. We're going to invite you to just whisper that before the throne of grace. And so let's take a moment, if we could, and let's pray together. Lord, we ascribe to you your character and your nature. We are grateful for what the Bible tells us and teaches us about who you are. That you're a, a God of holiness. A God of love. That you are all places at one time, all at the same time, always present. Lord, hear our prayers of adoration. Will you take a moment and offer your adoration to God? The sea reminds us of confession. Will you offer words, prayers of confession? Lord, I'm sorry. God, forgive me. Lord, help me. Hear these words of scripture this morning. If you confess your sin, that he is faithful and just and will forgive you your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Will you offer him thanks this morning? The T, thanksgiving. Tell him thank you this morning. We pause to thank you for the movement of your Holy Spirit on a college campus and pray that, Lord, you will continue to draw people to yourself, that you will break out of the boundaries of Wilmore, Kentucky, that a movement of God would continue in so many different locations, so many places around our country. We would welcome you, Lord, even this morning. Adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and the S is supplication. Now I'd like to invite you. Whisper the name or names of people right out loud this morning that you're carrying inside of your heart. And I invite you this morning, will you pray the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Please be seated.
Let me ask you this morning, if you recognize this melody that uh, Kathy is playing on the piano. Uh, All right, so uh, here we go. Hands up if you recognize this melody. Hands up. Ooh, okay. Now, uh, <clears throat> not bad, not bad. Uh, so I grew up inside of a church that uh, every single Sunday we sang this song, okay? And so the melody is kind of imprinted, you know, inside of my life and inside of my heart. It was exactly the same place Every Sunday, uh, they took the offering, and as they took the offering, uh, the head usher uh, would convene at the back after they took all the offering, and then uh, they would uh, play this song at the very beginning, and as this song was being played, the head ushers would lead the ushers back down to the front of the church, and everyone would sing the doxology, would sing the doxology. Now, interestingly enough, we live in a post Christian culture, and so as a result of that, uh, many of our students don't know this song. Uh, on, well, I was having a conversation uh, with actually one of Jeremiah's daughters uh, who is going to school over in Delaware at a, a, a Christian uh, classic education situation, and she said to me, we sing this song every day before lunch. And I said, did you know this song before you went to school? She said, no. And I thought, oh man, uh, here I'm the pastor of the church. Uh, she doesn't know this song. I thought, you know, we probably ought to revisit some of this, but we're going to revisit it today for a completely different reason than what you're thinking about. So let's throw the words of the doxology on there. Now, maybe some of you might uh, not recognize the, uh, uh, the tune, but you might recognize these words. And so 17th century... A guy uh, penned these, so mid 1600s, I think, and uh, just a regular guy who was participating in the church. It's kind of bubbled up through the church then, uh, the doxology. So, Kathy, play it for us again, if you will, please. <clears throat> Here we go. If you know it, sing it. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above, ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Ah, uh, can't forget the Amen. Right. Good. Now, what I'd like for you to notice, if you will, please, are the words. Are the words. There's something about uh, the idea of the doxology that reminds us of who is responsible in receiving the recipient of our praise. Notice the words, all blessings come from God. All people participate. Even above the heavens or above the angelic host, we sing and we praise God. The three-in-one God, not to be confused with any other God. I want to talk with you a little bit today about the first word that's common of each one of these lines inside the doxology. I want to frame that inside of the understanding about what we've been thinking during the last couple of weeks. Last Sunday, there was a bit of a practicum as Kristen led us about how we might go ahead and frame our week and shape our week. And I just kind of want to add to some of the content of that, if I could, this morning. I want to uh, invite you to think with me and be reminded of what we've been using for a definition for worship about how we can practice inside of our lives God's presence, how we might structure our lives about always being mindful about God, how we can go ahead during our 
time here at church and time even outside of our church family, we might think about God and that He might draw close to us and we might draw close to Him. One of the ways in which we find that to be the case is with a heart and an attitude towards God in all situations. Let's be reminded of our definitions if we could. A.W. Tozer said that worship is to feel inside your heart. To feel inside your heart. Recognizing this isn't something that you've generated yourself. It's not something that you're going to work up a feeling, but that God has done something inside of your life and you can express back to God in an appropriate manner. That we humble ourselves, we humble ourselves before God with a sense of awe, meaning that's just, He's uh, beyond description, right? That God is beyond compare, a sense of awe, a sense of wonder, a sense of overpowering love. That our heart is inclined in God in these directions. Now we said maybe a bit more of a simplistic definition is this, as Dallas Willard said, it is an intentionally, now we're going to come back to that word, Keep that word in mind, the intentionality, intentionally. Turning our mind toward God and ascribing back to God. That's what we just participated in. That was the A, right? Adoration, ascribing back to God all of His greatness. All of His, there's the T, His goodness to us. And all the glory that belongs to Him. That's what we've been thinking about. How to do this? Because we're created for worship. We're created for Him. And who we are, we find our our life and our being, our sustaining inside of who He is. And so I want to think with you about that. A pretty familiar passage of Scripture, uh, one that you might recognize, some of you certainly might know by heart, uh, at least a line or two of this, Uh, is Psalm 150, Psalm 150. Now, what's interesting is that uh, the Psalms, those 150 poems inside of your Bible, uh, they are the worship literature of the Old Testament. Here inside of the Psalms, we understand who God is, we understand who we are, we understand our response to God's movement inside of our world, and we get a clear description of who God is. And so the Psalms, 150 chapters, uh, they kind of escalate and they kind of crescendo here at the last part of the book. Psalm 145, 146, 147, 48, 49, 150 all have to do with this idea about of an intentionality of praising God, praising God. And so Psalm 150 is kind of like, well, if you've ever been to a fireworks display, in the last couple of minutes of the fireworks display, you've been watching singular you know, explosions in the air, and ooh, that's pretty, ooh, that's wonderful. But at the conclusion of the fireworks display, it's the grand finale, right? And so they're shooting fireworks off everywhere. That's what Psalm 150 is, okay? It is the grand finale of the Psalms. So all over everywhere, why this becomes important. I was reading... Uh, about Psalm 150 and a story uh, happened out in Omaha, Nebraska in a Presbyterian church. And the pastor in the Presbyterian church on a Sunday morning that he was talking about this passage of scripture handed red helium balloons to everybody who came into the building. Now I thought about this momentarily Only momentarily. And uh, red helium balloons. And here was the instruction. When you sense God's presence and your heart is erupting with praise, let go of your balloon. And I thought, yeah, I like that. It's a great idea. The interesting thing was, At the end of the worship service, 
one third of the people still held on to their balloon. You see, the idea of praise towards God is not something that happens naturally for us. And not only does it not happen naturally, we have a tendency that when we're doing this by ourselves, even in our own prayer time, it feels awkward and it feels unnatural in these circumstances. The truth is that many of us, even though you come to Sharptown Church, and even though we talk about what worship is, just because we're exhorting you to be people who praise, you still hold on to your red balloon. So I want to talk a little bit more about that today and and think with you about how does that happen inside of our life and what can we do? Now, Psalm 150 is a good psalm for us to talk about because it's prescriptive. It's prescriptive. It tells us where, it tells us why, it tells us what, it tells us who. It's a good one. It's a good psalm. Six verses is all it is. And so see if you can pick out the where, who, what, why of the psalm. We're going to talk just a minute about that. Let's go to the next slide. And and here's what I'd like to invite you to do. Uh, Read with me, if you will, please. Read with me. Uh, Praise the Lord. Praise God in His sanctuary. Praise Him in His mighty heavens. Praise Him for His acts of power. Praise Him for His surpassing greatness. Praise Him with the sounding of the trumpet. Praise Him with the harp and the lyre. Praise Him with timbrel and dancing. Praise Him with strings and pipe. Praise Him with the clash of cymbals. Praise Him with resounding cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Okay, so six verses, uh, breaks up pretty easily. Let's go back to the first slide from Psalm 150. And here we are. I want to think with you a little bit about the language we find here. Now... What's hard is that there are seven words inside of the Old Testament Psalms in Hebrew that have to do with praise. And so this is the most dominant word inside the Old Testament with the word of praise. You can't see it here. It's Hebrew. Okay, this is English. We translate this praise the Lord, but the word here is Hallel. Hallel. Now... Stay with me for a minute because I'm not the sharpest knife in the drawer when it comes to language. I really am not. And, uh, and listen, uh, I almost lost my college degree because of language, okay? So uh, stay with me, if you will. Again, not the sharpest knife in the drawer. Hallel uh, is the first part of the word. And then oftentimes you add prefix and suffix to the word. The beginning of another word, and it makes another word. So, Hallel has to do with praise. The word that you're familiar with is the ya, is the ya. Now, the word ya inside of the Bible in the Old Testament is the first word, the first syllable for the word God. Okay, so God Yahweh, ya, that's the ya. Okay, Hallelujah, Hallelujah. Yeah. Are you with me? That's the word. What is it? It's hallelujah. Say it with me just to indulge me. One, two, three. Hallelujah. Not bad. One, two, three. Hallelujah. I doubt many of you never say that word except in church. It's one of those church words. That's the word. Hallelujah. It's translated praise the Lord. The Lord, the yeah, the God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Praise God. So that's the admonition. That's the encouragement. We are invited to be people of praise. People of praise. The one thing that marks the life of a Christian is that we find ourselves as people of praise. 
Not because of who we are and we're optimists. Or not because the glass is always half filled. And not because we have that kind of a face all the time. No, no, no. Because we have a God who is worthy and deserving of our praise. Are are you with me? It's not about us. It's about God. Hallel, yeah. Hallelujah. We praise you, God. You are the one who's the object of our praise. Why do we praise him? Why do we praise him? So uh, we got the admonition, the instruction. Here's the why. Praise God in his, or the, the where, excuse me. Praise him in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. The uh, King James Version says, praise him in the firmament now the reason the psalmist used the word firmament is because you should be reminded that that's the word used in the very beginning of genesis where god moved among the firmament all of creation god was there where do we praise him we praise him collectively when we come together we praise him collectively when we gather for worship we praise him privately when we're walking about inside of his world we praise him in all circumstances and at all times we praise him our attitude is inclined in his direction we intentionally we intentionally praise him why for his acts of power for his surpassing greatness for what God has done now you're thinking well gosh Doug I've not seen God do much inside of my life And many of us have just recently come to faith or we're new in faith. And here's one reason we can praise God. Uh, Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5.17 that he's taken the old and he's making it new inside of your life. That's one reason we can give him praise. We can see his hand inside of our life. And so out of the book of Psalms, we see a remarkable moment where the psalmist constantly reflects upon the why about who God is and what is it we can praise him for Psalm 139 he formed us while we were still in our mother's womb Psalm 22 he sent Jesus to die for our sins Psalm 23 he is the good shepherd in all areas of our life Psalm 32 he offers us forgiveness of sin Psalm 57 he describes how God is sufficient in all times inside of our life Psalm 71 he taught us about his grace Psalm 119, he tells us that we can hold on to his word in all circumstances. We praise him for his acts of power and for his surpassing greatness. We praise him. Now you're thinking, gosh, uh, Doug, uh, you don't know uh, me. I am a, I'm not really kind of verbal about that. I, I just don't say those things out loud. And my faith, I, I don't want to get a little too carried away about that. And, and so let me just go ahead and let's continue with the psalm. Let's see how the Bible helps us here. So the Bible says, we praise him in such a way that other people see. That's what kind of what's going on here. We use instruments. The Bible uses that terminology. We use instruments and uh, we play the trumpet. Now these aren't exclusive. The trumpet has been replaced. Well, maybe not replaced. If some of you play the trumpet, we would love to have you come see us and talk to us. Uh, You know, the drums get played or the piano gets played or the guitar gets played. And Dave knocked it out this morning. Okay, so the harp and the lyre. We praise him. And by the way, Oh, the word praise in musical instruments, that's, that's another Hebrew word inside the Old Testament. And then, listen, I've been to enough weddings at Sharptown Church. I don't want you to dance here, okay? I just, uh, no, I'm just teasing. <laughs> you don't want to see me dance either, right? It's an outward demonstration about what God is doing in our lives. Praise. How do we do that? You see, so here's the interesting thing, and and stay with me if you will. Praise is not only vertical adoration and thanksgiving, but praise is horizontal too. 
Now, I've been thinking about this this morning for a number of weeks, and uh, it just happens to collide, right, with this big game that's going on this afternoon, and I've been kind of living, thinking my way through this in cooperation with what God's doing at, at my alma mater down in Kentucky, and the question really the Holy Spirit's been whispering is, you know, uh, Doug, I understand your praise here, but in comparison, but what about out here? here. Have you talked to more people about what's going on in culture than you have about me? It's a good question for us today, right? I mean, after all, uh, we're hosting, we're yelling at the TV, hopefully we're not going to be throwing things, but maybe uh, later on. Uh, but in comparison, right? So the psalm closes here with these words. Next slide. <clears throat> Isn't that a great way to say that all of us should be a, have a heart of praise? I mean, I'm thinking we're all breathing, although I'm looking around, maybe not too sure about some of us, but no, I think we're all breathing this morning. I think we're all breathing. Do you know that Jesus, when he comes into the gates of Jerusalem in the last week of his life, he said this. Don't keep them from praising. This is an incredible statement. Don't keep them from praising because if they aren't allowed to praise, the rocks will cry out. I'm thinking, how does that happen? That all of creation cries out. In the book of Hebrews, the writer says this, that when we intentionally when we intentionally choose to praise God, we, it's like we bring a sacrifice. We bring a sacrifice, and that's exactly what the Bible says. It's a sacrifice of praise. We don't feel like it. We're not feeling it. We, look, but God, we are praising you intentionally. Now, I clearly understand that just because we're sharing this about what worship looks like and I'm kind of exhorting you to be people of praise does not mean we're all going to go out and incorporate that into our lives. I understand that. As a matter of fact, well, let's do it this way. Uh, some of you would push back and say, you know, I'm really not wired that way, Doug. I'm not wired uh, that way and uh, I'm really not too much of a, of a verbal optimistic sort of a person, which reminds me, uh, Roy Lauder, uh, who's been here to speak on occasion, uh, Roy Lauder, uh, he opens up his uh, messages regularly uh, with stories about uh, a guy named Ezra and a guy named Arzi. And these two guys are kind of like they're opposites of one another. And so we're going to say like Ezra was an optimist and Arzi was a pessimist. And so Ezra uh, says to Arzi, hey, listen, it's uh, sun shining out these last couple days. It's been beautiful. And uh, Arzi responds and says, you know, listen, uh, the sun's going to burn up all my crops. Ezra says, we really needed the rain and God's been good to us. And said, I can't get my tractor out of the field, it flooded. Ezra says, hey, listen, I got a new hunting dog. He's amazing. Arzi says, you mean that butt that's tied up behind your house? Ezra says, let's go hunting. I'm going to go ahead and we'll go duck hunting. And so they go duck hunting. And uh, Ezra shoots a, a couple of ducks and says, uh, go get them, boy. And the dog runs out on top of the water and comes back with the ducks on top of the water. And Ezra says to Arzi, how about that? To which Arzi responds, can't swim, can he? <laughs> Listen, uh, I'm inviting you to be people who praise and many of us are wired like that. And we can't get out of our own way sometimes. John Steinbeck, uh, Grapes of Wrath, he wrote a book called Traveling with Charlie, he has an interesting line that describes 
one of the waitresses in a diner up in northern New York. Let's find that next slide if we could. Steinbeck, notice his description. He says, it's strange how one person can saturate a room with vitality and with excitement. One person can do that. He said, then there are other people not like that. There's this one dame, he called her. She was a server at a diner. There's this one dame, uh, she was one of them, who can drain the energy and joy and can suck the pleasure dry and get no sustenance from it. Notice his description. It's a great sentence. Some people spread a grayness in the air about them. Now, I am fascinated with the way in which the Bible admonishes us, encourages us to be people who praise. As an act of our worship, admittedly, I think probably there are times when I spread a grayness in the air about me. Now, I am not saying everything is sunshine and unicorns. I'm not saying that. But it does give us pause this morning. To ask us, to invite us, to request that we would consider in our worship, in our 168 hours of the week, do we pause and ascribe back to God at any time words of praise, words of adoration, words of thanks? If you do not, I think that it's true what happens inside of our life, that what's inside of us finds itself outwardly. We demonstrate that, but also if there's a sense of gratitude. I've been with people who do this so easily. And you've been with people who do this easily. And so I just want to invite you once again this morning Let's read the words of Psalm 150. Read the words of Psalm 150. Let's uh, stand up with me, if you will. <clears throat> I know what you're thinking. Is he ever going to end? Come on, Doug. Kickoff is in six hours and 30 minutes, and I have to get home. I got to get home. <laughs> uh, read with me. Uh, this prescriptive psalm, this prescriptive psalm. Again, this is the crescendo, this is the climax, this is the worship literature of the Old Testament. 149 psalms lead up to this, because this is the capstone. This is what we're to take away. Read with me. Praise the Lord. Praise God in His sanctuary. Praise Him in His mighty heavens. Praise Him for His acts of power. Praise Him for His surpassing greatness. Praise Him with the sounding of the trumpet. Praise Him with the harp and lyre. Praise Him with the timbrel and dancing. Praise Him with the strings and the pipe. Praise Him with the clash of cymbals. Praise Him with resounding cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And so in comparison, we started the service with a, uh, a fight song. Uh, not asking necessarily to go ahead and do that again, but let's replace that if we could with a song that's been part of the tradition of the church for years and years. Let's go to the next slide if we could. Okay, so here we go. I know it's brand new for some of you, but for others, it's not. And I want to invite you. Will you offer your praise this morning? Sing with me. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him, above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Not the amen yet. Hold on. Okay. By the way, if you're a person who is on YouTube a lot, if you just type in the doxology, there are some terrific contemporary contemporary treatments of this song 
and I think that you'd kind of enjoy. Uh, again, uh, a bit slower this time, and uh, I want you to go ahead and allow the words to kind of seep into your heart this morning of praise. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Now, Amen. Now. We all have the same amount of time from this Sunday until next Sunday. I merely want to invite you, will you create some space inside of your week to offer your praise to God independently by yourself? Work hard at it. Next week we're going to talk about why that is so important in the midst of our lives. And so friends, go in peace. God bless you. <clears throat>